Jacob in the land of the sons of the east. Last week, remember we talked about Jacob when he was uh, at home, uh, just to recap a little bit, and you would do well to, uh, to read the stories of Jacob in chapters 25, 26, 27. We know that Jacob had a, uh, an older brother. They were twins. Things just aren't working tonight. If you have a cell phone, please turn it off, completely off, because that interferes with the, that interferes with the, uh, with the uh, signal. Okay. Uh, Jacob had a twin brother named Esau. Esau was born first, but it was prophesied that Jacob would uh, be the, the one who would lead, that Esau would serve his older brother. And we read the story about how Esau sold his birthright to Jacob. And we read the story how Jacob connived his father, uh, Isaac, into the blessing. And how Jacob was a trickster, they call his name was trickster and supplanter. Somebody who would trip somebody up. And when we talk about the Jacob stories that we started last week and that we're going to be reading through, we read about this, this man who went from being a trickster to a prince of God. Uh, we're going to read about the foundation of the chosen nation. And we're going to read about how out of deception and prolonged service came the blessing to the world because God made promises to Jacob. Last week we talked about uh, Jacob's dream. Jacob in the house of the Lord. Remember Jacob, as he, his, he had to flee his home because his brother Esau wanted to kill him. So on his way, his mother told him, Jacob, you need to go to my, uh, my brother's house. And you need to go there and you need to look for a wife there. Because Esau had taken wives of the Canaanite. And they wanted to, make, they wanted to keep the line pure because it was through that line that Messiah would come. So they told Jacob, uh, if you remember, if you read the story, Rebecca told Jacob, go to my brother Laban, uh, stay there a few days and come back, where we're going to find out that it ended up being like 20 years. But uh, he left, and on his way, he had a dream, and he saw what we call Jacob's ladder, where he saw angels ascending and descending from heaven, and a picture of how God answers, hears and answers prayer and so forth. And we said that when... Uh, God promised him in that dream, he promised him that he and his seed would possess the land. He said that he promised him his seed would be as the dust of the earth. He promised him that all the peoples of the earth would be blessed by his seed. He promised him that God would never leave him, and he promised him that he would bring him back to his land. He gave him all these promises to Jacob. And some of them might say, well, you know, Jacob was kind of a scoundrel. He was a, you know, he was a, you know, a con man. How could God bless him? Well, we're going to, as we read through the story tonight, we're going to see a couple different underlying foundational kind of thoughts here. Because God is a faithful God. He's faithful and just to keep his promises. He's also faithful and just in holiness. God has a, a reason and a way for everything. And while he blesses his people, and he keeps his promises, he will not allow his people to go without dealing with their sin. Okay? And we're going to see that. It's kind of an underlying thought here tonight. Okay. Starting at verse 1, it says, Then Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. This is chapter uh, 28, I believe. 29, I'm sorry. Chapter 29. Then Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. And he looked, and behold, a well in the field, and lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks, and a great stone was upon the well's mouth. And there were all the flocks gathered, and they rolled a stone from the well's mouth, and watered the sheep, and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in its place. What, what is being described here, and again, it's kind of hard to imagine, because most of us, I don't think anybody here grew up on a farm or, you know, where they raised sheep. But in those days, there were, in a, in a land, there were different shepherds. They all had their different flocks. And this was obviously a common watering hole. 
where they would take all the sheep to water them. Um, and uh, it was a common place. So uh, there was a, a, a well there, and there was a stone over it, and they would take the stone off the well, and they would water the sheep, and so forth. It was a, a community, community uh, project here, okay? As we read on in verse 4, And Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be ye? And they said, Of the city of Haran, which was where Jacob was heading. And he said unto them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? which is uh, uh, Jacob's uncle. And they said, we know him. And they said unto them, is he well? Kind of good questions. And they said, he is well, and behold, there's his daughter Rachel coming with her flock. Okay. Well, when Jacob took a good look at Rachel, and he said, lo, it is yet high day, neither is the time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep and go feed them. What, what, what Jacob was saying here was to these herdsmen, as he saw Rachel approaching and he knew that was Laban's daughter, he said, hey, maybe you guys ought to get your sheep and kind of, you know. Because he wanted to talk. He, he seen Rachel. And listen, it was love at first sight. When he laid his eyes on Rachel, and that's just an artist's rendition up there, but when he laid his eyes on Rachel, she was beautiful. And she was the candidate because she was in the family. It was, her, it was his cousin. Now, today we think cousins don't marry, but in that time, in, at the beginning of the race, again, at the beginning of things, they, you know, God wanted Abraham. He told him to keep it in the family, to keep it pure and keep it okay, undefiled. That's why Esau was disqualified from... from uh, being the, you know, part of carrying the line on because he married Canaanite women and God didn't want that. So they said, well, we can't leave until all the flocks be gathered together until they roll the stone from the mouth when we water the sheep. So the people said, well, we can't leave because we all water our sheep together. So Jacob had to kind of put up with them guys being there so he was going to introduce himself to uh, Rachel. And while he yet spake with them, it says in verse 9, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled a stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. He said, here, Rachel, excuse me, let me do this for you, okay? Jacob's in love, in love at first sight. He's in love with Rachel. And he goes on and he says this. He couldn't help himself. And Jacob kissed Rachel. My. <laughs> this stranger, she had never seen him before. He kissed her and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. Rachel must have been pretty excited about this too. Now, if, as we read this story, it brings back memories of, if you remember the story about when Abraham sent his servant to the same place, to get a, a bride for his, his son Isaac. And there are some similarities here, but here this is like a first person instead of a servant going there. Okay, it was at a well, not the same well because that well was a little different, but it was the same kind of situation. Jacob didn't have to put out any fleece if this is the woman he wanted. As soon as he laid eyes on her, he said, that's it, that's her. So he kissed her and he said, uh, you know, uh, Go tell your father. And she did, and she ran. And it came to pass when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. And he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely you are bone and my flesh. And he abode with him the space of a month. So uh, Uncle Laban greeted his nephew, uh, Jacob, and he just loved him. And he said, Come on, move in, settle down. Uh, man, it's good to have you. Your family. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because you are my brother, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me what will your wages be? That can be a dangerous question. He said, uh, You're here. You're working for me. What do you want? What can I pay you? What can be, you know, what's your, uh, what would you desire for, for me to pay you? Well, Jacob could have said, I want so much, you know, per month or so much per week. But that's not what he wanted. Instead, he said this. He says, I'll tell you what, Laban. 
it was, says in verse 16 that Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed. If you read the Hebrew and find out what those words means, that means she was sickly. She was not much to look at. Somebody might say, we might use the word homely. Somebody might say ugly. I won't say that. She wasn't much, but she was the older daughter. And the younger one was Rachel, and she was beautiful and well endowed. I think we understand what that means. Uh, I can remember, I can remember uh, uh, there, was, there was an episode of Andy Griffith. Ever watch Andy Griffith on TV? And Andy Griffith was talking to uh, Barbara Eden. And Andy said, nature's been real good to you. <laughs> well, I think nature was real good to Rachel, okay? So, you know, there were two daughters here, okay? And uh, there was the elder and the younger. Leah, uh, again, her, her name means wearied. Wearied. Uh, she was tenderized, sickly, weak, homely. Rachel, her, na her name means you, beautiful and well-favored. Jacob, the younger of two sons, desired the younger of the two sisters, but the elder stood in his way. He didn't know it at this time. See, but the elder stood in his way, even as his elder brother stood in his way. You know, God has a way of making us painfully aware of our past sins. Okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit later. That's an underlying motif. So Jacob says, so Jacob says, says, Jacob loved Rachel and said, I'll serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, well, it's better I give her to you than somebody else. So, okay, it sounds good with me. Now, Laban, see, see, Jacob, remember we said before that Jacob was a con man. He was a trickster. That's what his name was, trickster. Jacob met his match. He must have, he must have inherited what he was from Uncle Laban. Because Laban said nowhere in this, in this conversation. Well, you know, Jacob, we have a thing here where we live. There's a, a tradition and a custom. We can't marry our younger daughter before we marry our older daughter. He could have said that. And, you know, but maybe Laban thought, well, you know, Leah's not that good looking. And I don't know. <laughs> I might, I mean, this whole thing might go down the tubes here if I say anything. So instead he just said, sure. All right. Sounds good. Laban said, I'd just soon give her to you than anybody else. So, it says that Joseph, uh, Jacob served him for seven years for Rachel. And to Joseph, it just seemed like nothing. It seemed like a couple days. Because he loved Rachel. And every day, I could just imagine, just put this in your mind, you know, if you could see like a, a scene in a movie. Every day for seven years, here goes uh, Jacob out to take care of the flocks. And he sees Rachel and he says, Rachel, it's, it's, it's uh, six years and ten months. Six years and nine months and 29 days. Six, uh, he, just, he, he was counting them down because he loved Rachel and he wanted Rachel. And, and, and he, he's probably thinking, and I'm just reading this in, to, okay, this is just my you know, take on it. That he was probably thinking about how God told him about all the, these children he would have and there would be a, his seed would be like the dust of the earth and God was going to bless him. He's thinking, God's blessing me. God's bl he's going to bless me with Rachel. I keep working seven years. I'm, I'm gonna, he's blessing me with Rachel. Okay? Well, the seven years passed quickly to him. We read one verse of seven years. And at the end of those seven years, Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife. For my days are fulfilled that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of that place and made a feast. And I guarantee you Laban made sure there was lots of wine at that feast. Okay. Laban knew what he was doing. Because when they would have a marriage feast, it would go on for days. They would party for a couple days. And then, you know, it, the marriage would be consummated when the husband and wife would go into the marriage chamber and, you know, consummate their marriage. So they're partying for however long, and they're having a good time. And, and it came to pass in the evening, when the time came, Laban pulled the old switcheroo. I mean, he did, you know, he took Leah. Now, you have to understand, back in those days, when it was dark, it was dark. They didn't have lights. You know, they had, like, torches. 
and there had been a lot of drinking, and there had been a lot of whispering, and there had been, you know, and instead of Rachel, he pulled the, the quick change, and he sent Leah in, veiled, ready for her husband. And Jacob was probably, hey, man, this is it, seven years, seven years. And he woke up in the morning, and it came to pass. He looked, and he said, just put yourself in his position. You know, I ain't going to talk about some of us before we were saved, but just put yourself in his position. Man, he'd been seven years, he'd been working for his lovely, beautiful Rachel, and when he wakes up and the light comes in the morning, he looks, and it's tender-eyed Leah. Number one, can you imagine his feeling toward her? You know, his anger, his bitterness, he got ripped off. But you know, if you, again, trying to uncover the, the underlying motif of this whole thing, it wasn't just a few years before this, maybe seven, eight years before this, that Jacob disguised himself as his brother. He disguised himself, the younger disguised himself as the older, now we have the older disguising herself as the younger. The faithful God, he's faithful to keep his promises and he's faithful to make sure that his people deal with their sin. He reminds us of the things we've done. And all, I don't know, Jacob maybe didn't get a hold of this right away, but God was in the process of disciplining and training him. He went to Laban and he said, what have you done to me? I've worked for you for seven years for Rachel. Now, you've beguiled me. You've tricked me. Well, Jacob knew something about that. Laban said, it must not be done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Jacob's probably thinking, well, I wish you would have told me that seven years ago. <laughs> we might have been able to work something out. Fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also for the service which you shall serve with me yet another seven years. So Laban got another seven years out of Jacob for Rachel. Now, after a week, and again customary, after the week of marriage to Leah, Laban gave Rachel to Jacob, and Jacob had to work seven years. He didn't wait, have to wait another seven years for Rachel. He, he got her at that time. But we see here the underlying theme that the deceiver was deceived. God's rebuke and discipline of Jacob for his deception concerning the blessing. This is what this is all about. See, I really believe in all my heart, and this is kind of just what we can think, that if... You know, God promised that Jacob would be the one in charge. He didn't have to fool his father. He didn't have to deceive his father. I believe if Jacob would just have waited, I believe that God would have accomplished what he said he was going to accomplish. But instead he deceived him. Verse 25, he said, why have you beguiled me? It's the same word that he used in Genesis 27 to describe Jacob's deception of his father, Isaac. When you talk about the firstborn, the idea of the firstborn and so forth, again, this is coming back to haunt Jacob. And finally, God told Jacob that his brother would serve him. Jacob had to serve Laban for his daughters, as his old, older brother would serve him. So we see this, this coming back to haunt him, God allowing that to come back to haunt Jacob because of his sin. Even though God's people may experience God's blessing on their endeavors, God will effectively discipline them by making them painfully aware of their unresolved sins. And if this applies to Jacob, you know it applies to you and me too. God might bless you. He might bless your ministry. But he'll let you deal with the things from your past. He'll, he'll, he'll remind you of the times that you did not act in a godly way. And all of us could probably have those times. Okay. Now, reading on here a little bit. We begin a section of Genesis where God begins to build his program. Now, through all this, God knows exactly what he's doing. 
exactly what he has to do. We know, and as we go on in our study in Genesis, that Jacob eventually had his name changed to what? Israel. What we're going to read in these next few verses is the birth of the patriarchs of Israel. Today there's a land called Israel. What we're reading tonight and what we read in the Old Testament and what we read in the Bible is the story of the beginnings of what's going on right now in the world. If you watch the news, You'll find out that the United Nations is about ready to take a vote or whether or not to establish a Palestinian nation right in the middle of Israel. Land for peace is going on. See, it goes all the way back. People think the Bible is just something that's old, but the Bible is so current because it talks about things, the beginning of things that's going on right now. God builds his program. We see there's, a, there's going to be a competition now. Now we're, now we're going to be talking about the two wives, Leah and Rachel. Now, it doesn't say what they were like growing up. Can you just imagine, some of you, how many of you women have sisters? You grew up with sisters? Okay. Can you just imagine, there's two sisters. One's beautiful. One is not so good looking. Could you imagine growing up and the tension that was there? Okay. Now, we're going to see this tension increase because now both of them have the same husband. And the husband loves one, and he really hates the other. The competition between the older and the younger, competition between the well-favored and the ill-favored, competition between the unloved and the loved. Okay. There's a scorecard. We're going to keep a scorecard. You know, can't tell a player without a scorecard. <laughs> Leah, the elder. Rachel, the younger. Leah was not pretty. Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. Leah was hated. Rachel was loved. Leah was fruitful. Rachel was barren. Okay? We're reading about the beginning of God's program. Verse 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, see, God sees what's going on. He saw that Leah was hated. He opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, Surely the Lord has looked upon my affliction, now therefore my husband will love me. We're going to be reading about the birth of the patriarchs of Israel. The firstborn was named Reuben. They named the sandwich after him. Okay, no. Okay. Uh, the name means, look, a son. The Lord sees affliction. It's almost like she named her son. The Lord has seen my affliction. Look, he's given me a son. The firstborn of Jacob from the hated wife. Reuben became, uh, he, was, he was the firstborn. He was considered the one who was supposedly in charge. If you know the story about uh, Joseph, Reuben, when they sent Joseph or sold Joseph into slavery, Reuben was the one that tried to, tried to save him. He had some good points. But then he also did some things that were a little out of, uh, out, out of line too. But that's, that's kind of like another message. The first son, Reuben. Okay. So we see, as we check our scorecards, Leah 1, Rachel 0. Okay. She has one son, Rachel has none. If we read verse 33, it says, And she conceived again and bare a son, and said, Because the Lord has heard that I was hated. We keep hearing this about she's, she's hated. She, you know, she didn't do anything to deserve that. She was kind of thrust in that position. But she said, Because the Lord heard I was hated, he's therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. The, the name Simeon means the Lord hears and answers. It lets us know that God hears the cry of the afflicted. Have you ever been afflicted and you cried out to God? God hears you just as he heard Leah. Just as he heard Leah. Okay? Okay, our scorecard. It's two zip for Leah. Okay? Verse 34. And she conceived again 
And she bare a son and said, now this time will my husband be joined unto me. Now, finally, after three sons, he's got to love me. He's got to be attached to me. So, because I have borne him three sons, therefore his name is called Levi. And the, the, the word Levi means to join or to attach. Now, we know the, the, the children of Levi became the priesthood. Aaron and Moses and uh, the, the Levites and so forth, they became the priesthood. They were the ones in charge of being the intermediaries. They were the ones to attach God to man. Okay? That's where that name plays in. And she hoped her husband would be attached to her. She hoped after three kids, finally, will my husband love me? Well, obviously, it didn't happen. Okay? Back to our scorecard. Three nothing. We might say that Leah's winning, but it's not working for Jacob. Okay? Okay. The next verse, verse 35. And she conceived again, and she bore a son, and she said, Now will I praise the Lord. After four children, she's bore her husband, who hates her, four sons. What more could he want? She says, Now I'm going to praise the Lord. And she called his name Judah, because the name Judah means to praise. We, of course, know that out of the, the tribe of Judah came the Messiah. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ. Okay? All, these, all these names are so significant. So, she called his name Judah. Uh, after that, well, let's uh, look on a little bit further. The scorecard, Leah 4, Rachel still hasn't been up to bat yet. Okay. Now in chapter 30, in verse 1, when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, what did she do? She envied her sister. I wonder how many years Leah envied her sister because she was so much more beautiful than her. But now we see the tides turn. No longer is Leah envying her beautiful sister, but now her younger sister is saying, you know, envying her older sister because she has kids. And look what Rachel said. She said to Jacob, give me a son or I die. Give me children. Like, you know, and Jacob says, what are you, what are you telling me for? <laughs> Jacob says, his anger was kindled against Rachel and he said, am I God in God's stead who has withheld from me the fruit of the womb? Jacob, now again, does this sound familiar? If you remember way back when God promised, told Abraham that he was going to have a son and Sarah was barren and Sarah did the same thing. She, she blamed Abraham. She said, I need a son. Well, guess what? They did the same thing what Sarah and Abraham did. And she said, Behold my maid Bilhah, go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees that I may also have children by her. And she gave him Bilhah, her handmaid, the wife, and Jacob went in unto her. There was a surrogate mother. Just like today, they have surrogate mothers. Back in those days, they had, if a woman was barren, she could take a handmaiden or somebody that was hers, and, and they, she could be a surrogate mother, and it would be counted <laughs> as her child. And Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son, and Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and has given me a son, therefore she called his name Dan. The name Dan means judgment or judge. See, while when Leah was having children, she was praising the Lord. When Rachel was having children, she was vindicating herself. She says, God has judged. God has vindicated me. Now, interestingly enough, Dan, the tribe of Dan, and when you read through the history, the tribe of Dan was the first one to go into idolatry. If you read through the book of Judges and read through Joshua and so forth, especially the book of Judges, there's a story where... Uh, the tribe of Dan went forward and kind of established their own religion. So they were the first to go into idolatry. But it was the first one that was accounted to Rachel. So we see now it's four to one, Daniel, uh, or Dan rather, and I put the S-U-R there, that means surrogate. He was born from a surrogate mother, okay? But he, she, he was counted as Rachel's son, okay? And Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again and bare Jacob a second son, 
And Rachel said, with great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed, and she called his name Nephali. The word Nephali means wrestling, and it's almost like Rachel was saying, hey, I'm, I'm in the match. I'm winning the wrestling match with my sister. Because she hasn't had a kid in a while, and I've had two accounted to me. So you see the conflict that's going on here, okay? Almost like the conflict between Jacob and Esau. Okay? Again, we have that underlying thing where Jacob is putting up with the same kind of thing that uh, he was involved with. So, see, Rachel has two now, Dan and Nephthali. Leah has four. Well, Leah wasn't going to be undone. And when Leah saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob to wife. And Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a son. And Leah called, said, a troop comes, and she called his name Gad. The name Gad means an overcoming victory. And it's like uh, uh, Leah was saying, okay, I'm back in the race. I mean, you see this competition going on. Couldn't God have found a better way to start his people? <laughs> poor poor Jacob. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jacob, Jacob. Jacob was just getting what he deserved, I think. <laughs> okay. The score is five to two. Somebody's keeping track. Okay? Now. And Zilpha, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a second son. And Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And she called his name Asher. And Asher means prosperity. God has multiplied me mightily. Okay? Now. The scorecard. Six to two. Okay? Now, now we come to a story... And there's so many stories in, in, in the Old Testament, but some of these stories, you have, to, you have to do a little bit of digging to understand what they're about, okay? And when, when I would read this story, I would just be reading through, and I'd read it, and I'd think, okay. But I, I wanted to dig a little bit to see what this is all about. Verse 14, and Reuben, which by this time was maybe six or seven years old, okay? He went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah, then Rachel said to Leah, give me, I pray thee, of thy son's mandrakes. Now, there's a picture of a mandrake, okay? I've never seen a mandrake other than a picture of it. I don't know what they are. I don't know if you can cook them. I don't know what you do with them. But if you, if you, if you study that word, the mandrakes, first of all, they're, they're used in a lot of different kind of pagan religions. They have like a, they have some kind of an aura about them. I don't know, but... But they believed in, 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 the time of the, uh, in the time of the Old Testament, they believed that mandrakes were, number one, they were an aphrodisiac, and they also believed that they would help in childbearing. If a person was barren, if a woman was barren, they would have, you know, they would drink mandrakes. So what Rachel was saying to Leah, they, give me, I pray thee of thy son's mandrakes, she was saying, hey, maybe it will help me have kids. Okay. So, uh, you know, that's her competitor. But uh, Leah said, is it a small matter that you've taken my husband, because Leah was the first one married to him, is it a small matter you've taken my husband, and would you take away my son's mandrakes also? Oh, so now, you know, what, what do you want everything? She, he, he loves you and he hates me, and now you want... Therefore he shall lie with thee... Uh, I'm sorry. And Rachel said, therefore he shall lie with thee tonight for thy son's mandrakes. They made a deal. He said, you can have them tonight. Give me the mandrakes. And Leah said, sounds like a good deal. So she took him up, took her up on the offer. And Jacob came out of the field in the evening. And Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come in unto me, for surely I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. And he laid with her that night. And God hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived again. And bare Jacob the fifth son. And Leah said, God has given me my hire because I have given my maiden to my husband. And she called his name Issachar, which means a reward. God has paid me. God has rewarded me. God has given me what is mine. Okay? You know what the score is. Who's keeping score? Okay. Seven to two. It's in the ninth inning. <laughs> it's getting there, all right? Okay. Verse 19, and Leah conceived again, 
and bare Jacob the sixth son. Leah had six sons and two through surrogate. And Leah said, God has endued me with a good dowry. So now will my husband dwell with me? Again, we see this theme all through this thing. Leah was saying she wanted her husband to love her. But he loved Rachel. He said, now will my husband dwell with me because I've borne him six sons. And she called his name Zebulun, which means inherited dwelling. She says, now maybe after six sons, now maybe will he take me as his own. We don't know, there's no indication that that ever really happened. Leah was always the ugly one. She was always, she was always the one who was just there because she had to be. But she bore him all these sons, including Judah, through whom the Messiah would come. Okay? Now, it looks insurmountable here for Rachel. There's 10 sons born. We know there were 12 tribes of Israel. So there's two more that need to be born. Okay? One of them we're not going to read about for a week or two. But we read, well, afterwards, uh, Leah had a daughter named Dinah, which, whose name means is judgment. Uh, but she's not a patriarch, so we don't know much about her. But verse 22, And God, after all this, God remembered Rachel. God waited. He waited to bless Rachel. And you know, those of us that know the story might understand why. Because Rachel had a son, and his name was Joseph. She conceived and bare a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. The name Joseph means God will add. She had a wish for another son, and we know that she did bear another son much later, whose name was Benjamin. That was, that's a few chapters away. But we know Joseph became the youngest son of Jacob until Benjamin was born. And we know the story about Joseph. He was, he was Jacob's favorite son. And as we continue to read the story, as we go on in the next several weeks, we're going to find out that Joseph became a hated one. The son of the lovely Rachel became hated of his brethren. And most of us know the story of Joseph, and that's much further down, down the road. Okay, now, the scorecard. Leah bore Reuben and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Gad, Asher, Issachar, and Zebulun, Rachel, Dan, Naphtali, Joseph, and eventually Benjamin. Now, we're going to stop there because as we go on to the next, to the next story, we'd be here for another hour and a half. But what I, what I want to do tonight is, we, if we, is we've read this story about Jacob and his children. Again, I want to re-establish you know it's a, it's a nice story to read about but the underlying purpose of that story is that God is faithful he's faithful to bless and he's faithful to chastise he's faithful to teach he's faithful to 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 keep his promises but he won't allow his chosen ones to go on without confronting their sin. Everything that ha happened to Jacob, and, and there's more, there's, there's more to the story. Everything that happened to Jacob with Laban, with Leah and Rachel, it was just a mirror of what he had done. And as we go on and we read these stories, remember last week we said that Abra uh, Jacob's journeying in the east began with a dream, nighttime with a dream. And when he comes back to land, it's going to, it's going to, be, it's going to begin with a wrestling match with God in a place called Peniel. We won't get there for a week or two. But God had to do a work in Jacob to get Jacob from being a trickster to Israel, a prince of God, because that's what that name means. He had to do a work on Jacob. And you know what? He has to do a work with us too. 
He has to deal with us too. God will bless you. He'll use you. He'll, he'll open doors. But God will bring you to a place where you have to come face to face with where you've been and what you've done. He's not going to let us go. And when he does it, it's not because he wants to be mean. Yeah, this stuff that happened to Jacob, we could say, oh God, what'd you let that happen to Jacob? We're not going to change. We're not going to be the people God wants us to be unless we go through that process of self-examination. And sometimes God puts it right in our face. You ever have God put something in your face? He doesn't do it to condemn. He doesn't do it to, to punish. He does it that he might turn us all into princes and princesses of God that we might bear his name with dignity and honor, even as Jacob did when his name was changed to Israel. And we know the story of his sons and how they hated Joseph and how they fought with each other and they ended up in Egypt. I mean, it's, a, it's an exciting story to see and to hear what God did, how he established his people, how he established the nation of Israel out of, out of Egyptian bondage in the book of Exodus. That nation was born, the covenant nation was born out of slavery, out of service. It would be nice if we get saved and we snap our fingers and everything turns just like a rose garden. But you know what? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a journey. Jesus called it the narrow way. He said it's a narrow gate, and you've got to press your way in. I wish you could just kick back and, and kick your feet up and say, man, everything is just going good, but it's not, it doesn't work that way. We've talked, we've used the word diligent, talking about, a few weeks ago we were talking about uh, reading in Second Peter. He said, be diligent, be diligent. Jacob. You, you wonder what might have been going on in his mind as all this was going on. Well, God, you promised me I'd go back to my land. You promised me I'd be a blessing. And all I get in my family is strife. I got my wife's fighting with each other. I got my kid. I mean, you know, you wonder if maybe Jacob, there were times Jacob thought, what's going on? But God was faithful to him. Sometimes we get to the point where we think, what is going on? Am I doing something right? Am I doing something wrong? Am I, have I missed the boat? Have I... Well, there have been times I've missed the boat. There have been times you have too. But you know what? If you're his, he will let you. He'll, he'll get you to the place where you'll, you'll see. You'll see. And he'll make you, he'll take you from being a con man to a prince of God. He'll take you from being whatever you were before you knew him to what he has said you are. You know, and I'm closing. I don't want to ramble on. But God, he, he told Jacob he would be blessed. He said that his, the, his offspring would be like the dust of the earth, that he would be a, a mighty man of God. But it took him 14 years and ultimately like 20 years to serve Laban, to get from where he was to where he needed to be. It, had, it took two wives that were battling with each other all through their relationship with him. Somebody back there said, I think Miss Jane said, what, 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 just, you just matter what Jacob went through. All for the purpose of establishing God's plan. Does God have a plan for your life? If he does, and you want him to establish it, you might as well get yourself ready to confront those things that you need to confront, to deal with those things you need to deal with, to be the people that God wants you to be. God can't bless sin, and he'll expose and discipline and chastise and restore and love. It's a process.
it's a, it's, a, it's a tough process. We're reading about a tough process here. But God wants to do that in your life. Amen? Amen. Let's have a word of prayer.